This is Real Ghost Stories Online. When you surround yourself with negativity, albeit inadvertently, it can take its toll on you. If you're surrounding yourself or surrounded by people with negative intent uh, that are very much not in a good place, the results can be quite dramatic. Uh, In our next story, we hear about a family that uh, chooses a home or a place to call home, uh, which happens to be above a bar in Brooklyn, starting in the 1950s. Very rough bar. They go there to hide the addiction of one of their children. The noise from the bar drowns out the noise from one of their sons. However, the noise in the apartment is very quickly discovered not to be that of the sun or the bar. There's something else, something very dark lurking in the corners of this apartment. What is it? What does it want? And what is it being fueled by? That's the question. Take a listen. When you think of haunted houses, you think of old castles or spooky Victorian homes, something with a tormented past. The last place anyone would think of would be a rundown room over a bar in Brooklyn. I spent my childhood in such a place. My parents couldn't resist the cheap rent and anonymity. We had secrets to hide. My much older brother was a raging alcoholic, and what better way to hide that affliction from prying neighbors than to live over a saloon? It seemingly makes no sense to have a liquor-addicted person so near to temptation, but it worked well for us. His outburst could be covered by the sounds of revelers in the downstairs watering hole. The building was set apart from the residential part of the street, and people were less likely to call the cops. They really couldn't live anywhere else. The eight large rooms held its own secrets as well. My father never made much money as a maintenance man for a local bank. He worked from 4.30 a.m. until 3.30 p.m. five days a week for the pricey sum of $50.50 a week. Now, by 1950 standards, the pay wasn't so bad, but we would never own a home. My parents moved to the top floor apartment over the saloon in the late 1940s, and by some quirk of fate, the monthly rent was $5.50 and would stay that for the next 26 years. It would prove to be a hefty price. We never saw the owner. We paid the monthly rent to a real estate agent. Eight large rooms with an odd late 19th century vibe. Tall ceilings, gas fixtures, claw foot tub, pull chain toilet, pocket doors, fireplaces, butler's pantry, foyer, lots of closets, and a dumbwaiter. The hallway curved alongside the rooms with each room having an entrance and exit, except for the small front bedroom. Years later, I looked up the date that the block buildings had been built and was shocked to see 1920 listed. There must have been some mistake in recording the property. The whole building seemed much, much older. Neighbors gossiped that it had once been a senator's townhouse that had been turned into a bordello and then a speakeasy. Eight rooms that were uneasily called home. The haunting itself was just under the surface of day-to-night living. There'd be unexplained sounds of whispering, footsteps, scratching in the walls, and the far-off banging of doors. This could all be chalked up to the fact that there was another tenant downstairs and an active business at street level that tended to attract vermin of the four- and two-legged variety, but some sounds couldn't be explained away too easily. The fluttering of wings against the windows was an almost daily occurrence caused by pigeons, perhaps? No trace of bird life was ever found on the windowsills. My superstitious mother thought there were a harbinger for bad luck. As luck would have it, we experienced a fair share of tragedy living there. During the day, the three rooms facing the side street were usually bathed in light. The remaining five facing the avenue were plunged in constant darkness. 
The most troubling area of the apartment was the storage room and darkened area of the hallway. This was where another dimension seemed to exist. The coldest part of the apartment year-round, where the disembodied sounds and feelings of unease were intense. Photonegative rats would pass the hallway, bedroom to bedroom. Twinkling lights would be seen in their wake. As a small child, I sensed the storage room was the center of something. The long hallway enabled me to ride a bike and roller skate indoors. I'd make sure to quickly pass the storage room on my run through the apartment. The funny thing was that I never feared to be inside the storage room. It actually felt safe. The place directly outside the door was another matter. It faced my bedroom. At night, my mother would keep the two doors in my bedroom open. One door led into my parents' room, the other to the hall facing the storage room. Nighttime brought terrors beyond the nightmares of a child. I'd be tucked in bed and would hear a noise, not unlike dying fluorescent lights, a very low hum. A large shadow would appear in the hall, blacker than night itself, shapeless nothingness. From the darkness would peer a pair of red eyes at the top, where a head might actually be. It would hang in the happiness of the room while I lay in bed, afraid to move. For when I moved, it inched closer. I would gather all my strength to scream and leap from my bed and scramble to my parents' room. As if there were safe perimeters, it never followed. Now, as a child's imagination is liable to take flight, I was vindicated when adults said that they experienced similar run-ins. My mother was always ready to lend a helping hand to anyone down on their luck. A relative, friend, a stranger. Our apartment was a way station of sorts, and there was plenty of room. A friend of my parents needed a place to stay after a messy divorce, and she was given the bedroom next to mine, one of the dark rooms. She unpacked and settled in, complaining about how chilly the room was for August. She took a bath that night and remarked about the clawfoot tub, the interesting carving of large reptilian-like claws and what appeared to be eggs. The next morning, she said she was ill. She packed up, and we heard that she had a mental breakdown. Years later, she told my mom that she must have been so depressed that she could have sworn that the feet on the tub were crushing the egg-shaped pedestal, that the large claws would be seen heard digging in and cracking the shells. My oldest brother saw the large, dark mass in the hall one night, one of the few times that he wasn't drunk. He'd gotten home late and walked down the hall to his room on the far end. He said he passed through a cold spot and was stopped in the tracks by a force that shoved him into a wall. He thought he had dreamed of the encounter, but there was a huge bruise on his shoulder. I met with something on the outside staircase as a small child. The sound of thousands of bees had lured me out of the landing one night. The thing, whatever it was, apparition or demon, was wearing a long black coat with a silky white scarf around the neck. A felt hat sat atop what appeared to be a rubber red devil's mask. Somehow the mask stared directly into my face, and I saw that there were no eyes, just two black holes spewing stringy tendrils of sooty smoke. The scene dissolved before my eyes, and my mother opened the door to snatch me from the edge of the stairs where I could have fallen to my death. She broke the spell. Pictures would fall off the walls and shelves, and nothing was ever where you had just left it. Insects, flies, roaches, maggots, weevils, by the hundreds, would be found in clothing, furniture, and food. No matter how frantically my mother cleaned, the pests would be back. The feelings of helplessness, fatigue, and surrender were the mortal glue holding the walls together. By the time I was twelve, nothing was shocking. We had lived amongst the oddness, had become part of the parcel of daily life. The apartment fed off evil. The daily fights of barroom drunks and the raving of my brother's descent into alcohol-fueled madness kept the forces in motion. On a morning in 1965, I was ready to leave for school when my mom motioned me from the kitchen to the foyer. My mother stood stock still pointed to one of my brother's rooms down the hall. Just outside his closed door was an old suitcase with a straw hat on top of it. Beside it, a walking stick. 
Thinking it was some item that my brother had brought home from work, my mom told me to go get it and put it in the side closet. As we both walked down the hallway, the suitcase, hat, and stick vanished into thin air. During the 1960s, burglaries were becoming common in the neighborhood. Our single skeleton key, no pun intended, was our only defense, which somehow approved more than enough. One night, a thief made his way over the roof and down into a hall shaft. As my dad left for work, he heard moans coming from the door to the roof. He opened the door to find a man crumpled on the ladder inside the shaft. He was covered in scratches, and his clothing was shredded. The police were called, and the would-be burglar told the tale of demons who had attacked him, biting and clawing at him for hours. We'd leave our house of horrors in 1970. The new owner said he needed for his mother, who was arriving from Greece, a place to live. We left behind the ghosts, but took the horrors with us. My older brother would continue fueling the haunt for many years to come. The building still exists on a bright, sunny Brooklyn street corner. The downstairs bar is no longer a place for old men to drown their sorrows in cheap swill. It's now a sports bar filled with young internet influencers, and the two eight-room apartments are now six small apartments. The rent is no longer $5.50 a month, that's for sure. But I still think the renters pay a hefty price. I want to tell you that tonight this is real ghost stories online want a commercial free experience of the show with access to the world's largest audio archive of ghost stories sign up at apple podcast right now and try it for three days free ghostpodcast.com or patreon.com slash real ghost stories